Okay, so we're going on to our second speaker. Thank you. Um, this will be Brianna Keith from Bemidji State. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. All right, so I'm hoping you can all see this all right. Yes, looks great. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so thanks for uh, coming to this presentation today, everyone. I know it's uh, based on reading the abstract booklet. It's a bit different from your areas of ex expertise, but I hope it'll still pique your interest. So my name is Brianna Keith. I am a graduate student at Bemidji State University, and um, I'm part of I'm uh, a graduate research assistant on a project that investigates the common characteristics of Minnesota's amphipod-rich depressional wetlands. And if you're wondering what an amphipod is, um, that's these crustaceans pictured here. But I'll go into that in a bit more depth. Um, I also wanted to start off with acknowledgments. So my thesis work is one component of a much larger project that's led and supported by uh, many great people. So I'm presenting on the behalf of our larger research group today. So I have a list of uh, our project's principal investigators, many of whom are also my advisors, including Dr. Isaacson, who's here today, Megan, uh, Dr. Megan Fitzpatrick, who might be here. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, and then Dr. Danelle Larson and Dr. Michael Anto with the US, USGS, Jake Carlene, who's another grad student at BSU, Dr. Emily Schilling, who's um, a professor at Augsburg. And then we also received support from numerous undergraduate technicians, uh, federal and state land managers and private landowners. Great, so, um, so this research project revolves around some small aquatic crustaceans that are called amphipods. Uh, many people also refer to them as scuds or side swimmers. We've identified three different species in Minnesota. Uh, amphipods occur in freshwater and saltwater ecosystems around the world, but we're focused on prairie wetland amphipods. Um, and they're important components of these ecosystems for two primary reasons. So because wetlands are incredibly productive systems, um, there's large quantities of detritus, detritus and senesced plant matter in the benthos of the uh, wetlands. So the amphipods break down and consume that plant matter and release nutrients back into the wetland. And then in turn, they themselves are a very important and high energy food source for many wildlife species. Um, and then, so through this process, they're just a very important link in wetland food webs. They're also considered biological indicators of ecosystem health because they, um, they typically react negatively to environmental disturbance and the prevalence of contaminants. So the overarching problem that triggered this study is that amphipod populations are in decline and that has in turn resulted in, an, in a decline in lesser scop species, which is the waterfowl species pictured here. Um, and we still have a limited understanding of the factors that affect amphipod abundance. So we wanted to study that in a bit more depth, especially in the remaining amphipod intensive wetlands that, are, that exist across the landscape. Um, so our focal area was the prairie pothole region, specifically in Minnesota, that's shown here. Um, that other picture is a, an example of a very amphipod rich wetland. And then the graph just kind of shows the importance of amphipods to scop. So we generally see higher abundances of scop on basins with high amphipod abundance. So overall, we sampled 67 wetlands throughout Western Minnesota for a wide range of uh, abiotic and biotic characteristics, including fish, vegetation, um, water chemistry, sediment, chemistry. Um, we also looked at landscape level characteristics through remote sensing. And I just put a little asterisk by the, the areas that I focused on, but I'm going to kind of cover everything today since it's all interconnected. Um, I'll spare you the details of our methods. Um, and kind of just dive into our, the highlights of our findings so far. So for aquatic vegetation, we looked at submerged aquatic vegetation. So that's vegetation that grows underneath the water surface. We also looked at emergent vegetation. So stuff like cattails and bulrushes. And for both of these, we looked at coverage, biomass and species composition. Um, so these are the, the results from our negative binomial regression modeling of amphipod density as a function of submerged aquatic vegetation coverage. Um, we also included other environmental variables as covariates. 
So we found a positive relationship between aquatic plant diversity and amphipod density for both amphipod species. Um, and we hypothesized that this might have occurred for a number of reasons, um, including the fact that plant diversity would lead to variations in the timing of aquatic plant emergence and decay, which in turn would provide amphipods with food and habitat throughout the year. Um, and then there may also be some indirect effects. So for example, high diversity may reflect overall wetland condition. Um, and diversity is also known to promote other ecosystem functions such as nutrient turnover, carbon availability and water purification. And then on, also on the aquatic vegetation note, um, we ran an RDA model. Um, so in this graph, the triangles are wetlands, the blue vectors are aquatic vegetation species. And then the two amphipod species that were most abundant in our wetlands um, are the response variables. So the two amphipod species are orthogonal to each other, which means they occupy, occupy different niches in the habitat um, and they rely on different plant species. Gamerus was strongly associated with star duckweed, which is a free floating plant. Uh, we think it may, it probably provides shelter and then also a surface for algae to grow on that they eat. And then Hyalella was associated with vegetation species assemblages that were mostly comprised of narrow leaf, uh, submerged aquatic vegetation and filamentous algae, which also could provide similar benefits, but again, they just occupy a different niche. And then both species were negatively associated with a couple of submerged aquatic vegetation species that kind of dominate and they, um, they don't really allow for uh, increased aquatic vegetation diversity. And then they were also negatively correlated with cattail coverage and um, the presence of a carnivorous uh, submerged aquatic plant species. And all of this data is, uh, it's been submitted in a manuscript. It, the manuscript has been submitted and it's in review right now. So for predators, we looked at fish and amphibian abundance and then also the community composition of those. Um, so fish, fish invas invasions in Minnesota's wetlands have increased significantly in recent or in like the past 100 years, um, mostly due to the digging of ditches and drainage of agricultural fields, which increases the probability of fish invasions, which has historically uh, reduced amphipod and macroinvertebrate abundance in general. Um, but so far, we've only seen pretty distinct relationships between one species of our amphipods and fish. And that is the gam that gamorous abundance decreases with total fish biomass. And that total fish biomass is driven largely by black bullhead biomass. So that's the fish pictured here. Um, and those are benthivore species. So they primarily feed on stuff near the bottom of the wetland, um, including amphipods. And they could also lead to indirect effects um, such as reduced water quality from stirring up all that sediment, which in turn reduces submerged aquatic plant coverage. Now onto water chemistry, Look, we looked at three main metrics um, to get at wetland state, which I will discuss here. So um, wetlands and shallow lakes can exist in one of two states, either clear water state or turbid state. So in the clear water state, uh, there's, there's low nutrients and then in turn, not, not much algae production, which reduces turbidity, turbidity being a measure of kind of the cloudiness of the water, how many suspended solids are in the water that in turn reduce the light that's reaching the bottom. Um, so in clear water wetlands, there's low nutrient concentrations and accordingly uh, low chlorophyll A and turbidity. And then in turn, there's high plant coverage. And then in turbid state wetlands, um, there's those high nutrient concentrations that promote algae growth and reduce plant coverage. So we identified those two groups within our data set. And then we found that again, both amphipod species exhibit different responses. Uh, for gamorous, uh, we, we observed high abundances of gamorous in our turbid state wetlands, um, which we were kind of surprised by. And then high, high hyalella abundance typically occurred in more of those clear water state wetlands. So moving on to land use land cover. Um, so we, we looked at watershed level land use, we looked at riparian buffer coverage, and then also hydrologic connectivity. So overall land use and land cover alone is not a significant predictor of amphipod abundance. Um, as you can see in this graph, gamorous, both species persisted across a wide gradient of agriculture. 
Um, and we found that those landscape characteristics generally are stronger predictors of the abiotic conditions, such as water chemistry. Um, so there might be some indirect effects occurring there again. We found that Hyalella species exhibit, exhibited a weak positive correlation with riparian buffer coverage, which is pictured below. Um, that's basically the strip of upland vegetation between the water and adjacent agriculture. Um, and then we also found that gammarus didn't occur in wetlands with permanent inflowing streams. And that might relate back to the, the um, negative associations with fish and the presence of a stream, of course, would increase the probability of fish invasions. And then we also looked at the prevalence of pyrethroid insecticides and the relationship between those insecticides and amphipod abundance. So pyrethroids are particularly toxic to amphipods in laboratory studies, uh, which is why we decided to focus on those. About we one did more detect minute. them in 40. One oh, minute. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We detected them in about 40% of our study wetlands, but luckily they were at low concentrations and they did exhibit positive relationships land use, agricultural intensity predicted uh, pyrethroid prevalence, which wasn't too terribly um, uh, surprising. And then we also found that amphipod abundance doesn't react strongly to py the pyrethroid occurrence. We imagine because the concentrations are very low and um, there's also organic content in the sediment, which the pyrethroids bind to and it reduces bioavailability to the amphipods. So for our next steps, we're just um, planning on conducting more field work to understand those waterfall relationships in more depth. And then we're also planning on combining all of these covariates into one model to predict amphipod abundance. All right, that's all. So um, thank you again, and uh, I will take any questions you may have now. Okay, thanks so much. If you have questions, why don't you put them in the chat? Um, and I'll start with my standard question, and that is NASA has been somewhat behind the funding of this research. What would you say to the politician who funds NASA? Absolutely. So um, wetlands in particular have received a lot of attention lately in regard to climate change studies um, because of their importance in storing excess carbon. Um, they're just, um, and, and um, certain agencies are looking into like wetland restoration for reducing uh, carbon loading into the atmosphere. So this can kind of uh, work in conjunction with that. Um, we can kind of simultaneously meet two needs through west wetland restoration, which would include um, the restoration of wildlife habitat, and then also um, increasing the source of carbon sinks uh, across our landscape. Um, Are there other questions right now? If not, I will perhaps ask another one, but other questions right now from the group listening? Well, let me just continue then. Um, remind me, how long has this been going on? And so you said the trend is downward. Is it downward everywhere or is it downward and not and upward some places, which suggests what you should do about it? Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about uh, amphipod abundance, the downward trend in amphipod abundance. Yes. Yep. So um, so our, our study was informed by some previous studies about 10 years back that found um, that scop, which again are highly dependent on amphipods, were declining. And they realized it was because the amphipod component of their diet had been reduced. Um, so that, in a sense, started about 10 years ago. We did this study to um, more intensively understand those amphipod-rich wetlands. So this study in particular has been going on for about three years now, um, almost four. And um, we were actually surprised at the amphipod abundance across the landscape we expected it to be lower overall. Um, so we can't say for sure since we don't have super concrete amphipod data from the past. Um, but in Minnesota anyways, we um, found higher amphipod abundances than we expected, um, which, which could mean their populations are potentially increasing. Um, but previous studies also focused on the Dakotas. So there could just be some regional differences there. Okay, thank you. We probably should go on to the next speaker. Thanks again. Thank you.